Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I am David, a bookseller at Literati Bookstore, and we are pleased tonight to welcome um, Dr. Claire McCool and Dr. Rachel Wiseman to our At Home with Literati series in support of Metaphysical Animals, How Four Women Brought Philosophy Back to Life. <laughs> and just a quick webinar overview for all of our attendees. The chat is closed, but you can keep the chat window open as I'll be dropping links to purchase the book from Literati um, throughout the event and the Q&A is accessible. So please, please, please submit questions. If you have them, we will be asking them to our guests in the last portion of this program. And live transcription is available on your toolbar as well if you need that. And if you're watching us on YouTube, the links to purchase the book are in the description. And just a reminder, you can always shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeastern Michigan, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. And most of all, we'd like to thank you for your attendance this evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us. And now allow me to introduce our authors, Dr. Claire McCool and Dr. Rachel Wiseman are philosophy lecturers and friends. McCool is an expert in the philosophy of perception and aesthetics at Durham University, home of the Mary Migley Papers. Wiseman lectures at Liverpool University and is a recognized authority on the work of Elizabeth Anscombe. They're the co-directors of www.womeninparenthesis co.uk, a scholarly project that makes the case for analytic philosophy's first all-female philosophical school. And you all are set to go. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Um, it's so lovely to be here. Um, although we can't see anybody, we can only see ourselves, so we don't know who we're talking to. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great to be here. And um, today is the publication day mm -hmm. for Metaphysical Animals in America. So mm -hmm. this is our first bit of uh, publicity yeah. that we've done. And we're, we're really happy to be yeah, here. We're really happy to be here. It's I don't know if you can see the clock behind us. It's actually 11 o'clock in the UK. So uh, it's usually our bedtime, but <laughs> this is a bit of a treat for us. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we're going to talk to each other about Metaphysical Animals. Um, Rachel? Yeah. I <laughs> so let, maybe let's talk about how the book came about and um, maybe about in parenthesis as well. That's our mm -hmm. project about the four women. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so I suppose the book came about because, um, well, here's my version of yeah. it. Yeah. So um, about six or seven years ago, Claire and I were both sort of uh, beginning our lives as female philosophers. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much you know about the state of academic philosophy, but it's a very male dominated discipline. Um, it's sort of the whole canon that we read is very male dominated and the environment that you work in as an academic philosopher is, is very male dominated. And one of the things we were kind of noticing about our, our lives as teachers and about our engagement with the students was that loads of the really kind of promising and brilliant young women who we were teaching mm -hmm. were sort of leaving philosophy um, at the end of their undergraduate degrees and, and weren't kind of carrying on and were kind of going away from the subject with this idea that maybe philosophy wasn't really for them and that they didn't fit in. And obviously mm -hmm. that was a feeling we both, both had, had that it, feeling various, very yeah. yeah. Um, so that was the kind of context and, and Claire and I met each other at a, at a conference and sort of became chums through that really mm -hmm. and, and had lots of conversations about this stuff. And then um, we made this amazing discovery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so we read a letter by Mary Midgley uh, in The Guardian, which is a, a British newspaper. Um, and she was responding to another academic philosopher who'd, who'd questioned, um, who'd noticed that there were four women academics that had, had emerged as major voices in uh, 20th century British moral philosophy. And he'd noticed that they'd all been at Oxford during the Second World War. And he, he said, you know, was there something about the Second World War that made it the case that these four women were somehow able to flourish or to develop as philosophers? And Mary Midgey wrote back and said to The Guardian and said, well, yes, actually, there was, you know, the men were away. 
Um, and so our, our talents could kind of get the attention that they deserved. And so we read this and both of us sort of looked at each other <laughs> and thought, wow, is there really, is there something in this? Like, who were the men? What were they doing? Who was gone? Who taught them? We were really interested in the kind of structural conditions, as Rachel said, um, the way in which philosophy is practiced, why it might be that like brilliant young women are leaving. And we thought, well, is this something that we could learn from this kind of historical situation? Could we look at what happened when there were fewer men around? You know, may maybe we can kind of garner some insights to kind of support our women students. So that's what we started doing initially. Um, and Mary, luckily for us, lived down the road and she was, what, 96 when we started mm -hmm. visiting her. And mm -hmm. um, she was in a retirement home. And we first when we first met her, we took a, um, a, a, like a documentary crew with us so yeah. we could video her. Get and on. we thought because I mean, more for us, but because we knew we were going to be meeting this woman who was mm -hmm. in her late 90s, we were expecting to find somebody who was maybe going to not be able to remember very much or was maybe going to be, you know, very frail and, and not kind of, you know, maybe not wholly with it or something. And, you know, it was complete opposite of that. She was absolutely sharper than anything, sharper mm -hmm. than us, completely on it, utterly mm -hmm. present. We soon discovered that she was in the process of writing another yeah. book, <laughs> which, so this book was published, um, the week of her 99th birthday. Yeah. Um, so far from finding this kind of, you know, retired yeah. elderly woman who might be able to remember a few things, we found this living, breathing 97 year old philosopher. Yeah, who, 96 or something. Yeah, who was yeah. just desperate to tell us this story. Yeah, um, and it was just a complete tonic for us because, as Rachel said, we, we our students were leaving philosophy, we were struggling ourselves mm -hmm. also with the form of philosophy, I think, a little bit. Mm -hmm. It was quite it's not uninspiring because obviously we love it but it's just that it was seen so narrow in its scope and in the kind of mode of expression that was standard or was permitted I suppose it was considered professional it was quite narrow um but Mary has this like she had a really expansive view of what philosophy is what it could be her prose is just gorgeous it was really inspiring wasn't it, yeah, it was um but it was most of all her story about the her friends her and uh the, the three other women that are um, the main characters in our book. Um, she described their, you know, told us about their friendship, um, who taught them, that became incredibly important for us. But as we began to read their philosophy more closely ourselves, we began to see that, you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting, deep, significant kind of overlaps at really kind of crucial junctions in their thinking. Um, and also, you know, we came to we, we came to have an appreciation of the kind of depth of the and the nature of the different kind of friendships that they mm -hmm. had with each other and that was really lovely for us as well obviously as friends because you know we, we got we began to sort of get a deeper appreciation of like the significance of that kind of effective relationship and its intellectual significance how you can kind of develop intellectually through friendship and mm -hmm. through um, developing ideas together and everything mm -hmm. so I think yeah and just getting to know these different characters through reading their journals listening you know listening to Mary's stories um, I mean that was very much part of the joy of writing mm. the book wasn't it yeah but we should say what kind of book it is yeah so you know all of this excitement that we had from Mary and from thinking about the power of a story really to disrupt the dominant narrative but also um to kind of give what Mary had given us which is a sort yeah. of a picture or a vision of a different way of being a philosopher a way that kind of made it really embodied and really politically uh grounded in the historical moment mm -hmm. and you know and also sort of joy you know serious but also full of joy mm -hmm. so we kind of we had this combination of this beautiful group of women this kind of vision of what philosophy could be and then we also had this incredible historical background mm -hmm. because um just to say a little bit about the timeline so the the four women who are the the, the main subjects in in our book um they all the went up to oh yeah we've got some pictures of them yeah this this is them um so they all started at Oxford University um, in England 
um, just the year before, or, or one or two years before the First World War broke out. And the kind of the narrative of the book starts with that just before the outbreak of the Second World War. And then it follows them, you know, when they're sort of 18 year olds. So they're just these like lovely, young, excited women about to embark on this incredible intellectual adventure yeah. and on the cusp of, of life, really. And so they arrive at Oxford, then the war starts, Oxford empties out, uh, the university empties out of all the, 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 their male peers because they're all conscripted along with many of the male academics. Mm -hmm. And those people who are leaving are replaced by a, a kind of wave of refugee scholars coming um, from Europe, also waves of uh, refugees, uh, people fleeing the Blitz in London, um, and who's left behind in the university is the women and the conscientious objectors and these sort of old men as well who were maybe fought in the first war but were too old to be conscripted. So you get this kind of amazing moment where the whole hierarchy or, or structure of Oxford University is kind of exploded, isn't it? <laughs> And then all the men come back from the war and these women are now kind of growing up and they've had, they've graduated and it sort of follows them then up to the point where they all sort of become adults really in philosophy, don't they? Mm -hmm. So they're all in their mid, mid thirties. Mm -hmm. So um, we wanted to kind of use the world events, but also that drama of of that period of one's life mm -hmm. as a young woman mm -hmm. you know where you're going from being a girl to you know mm -hmm. some of them have got children and married and got jobs and it you know it's such a, a lot of drama so with all that and because Claire has such an amazing way of fit you know the way you think and write is so sort of cinematic I think and and full yeah. kind of visuals and, yeah and we like sounds. visual things we knew we didn't just want to write a sort of standard, mm -hmm. you know, academic mm -hmm. biography mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. you would call mm -hmm. it. Yeah, well, I think that goes back as well to our kind of um, frustration with with academic philosophy. Mm. The form of it seems so flat and so um, lacking in perspective in a way. So we wanted to bring perspective and vision and mm -hmm. colour and shape uh, to the narrative and I mean that that connects with the subtitle of the book so the book mm. is how four women brought philosophy back to life um, so the kind of academic philosophy that we see them kind of pushing back against is very uh, dry arid analytic now they are analytic philosophers right so they are analytic philosophers at the top of the kind of highest rank if you like but the kind of analysis they give the kind of philosophy they give is pragmatic it's rooted in kind of everyday reality you know everyday problems and just um the difficulty of actually sort of seeing reality and and uh, mor mor you know taking seriously mor moral dilemmas not as just kind of puzzles that you just you know that are kind of play things mm -hmm. uh, intellectual play things for philosophers but you know this idea of um they, they were taught by someone called donald mckinnon who's very important i think in our book mm -hmm. um and he was always impressing upon them the idea of, you know, as human beings, we find ourselves in moments of what he calls practical perplexity. Mm. Um, and that's just because there's so many different demands and there's conflicting demands at different times. And we have to try and kind of work out what to do. We have to kind of try and see what we have to do at a mm. particular moment in space and time. Um, and that difficulty and the difficulty could be like, you know, deciding whether or not you should leave your husband or whether you should, you know, well, in his case, he was a conscious, conscientious objector, mm -hmm. you know, whether he should go and fight against Hitler or not. Um, he did initially, he, he obviously was a conscientious objector, but then he, he was completely tortured by this, mm -hmm. wasn't he? And he, he did try and um, sign up in the end. But yeah, these, these very human... Mm -hmm yeah difficulties and you know that's in a way the sort of starting point for their philosophy mm. um mm -hmm. uh, and you know just if if you have if you think of philosophy just as a kind of sort of arid intellectual game mm -hmm. I mean these kinds of problems these moments as historical moments and kind of personal mm -hmm. 
uh, questions doesn't really come come into view mm -hmm. at all. Um, so one thing he also emphasized as well, which comes across in our title, Metaphysical Animals, is that we are the kinds of creatures who, who can ask questions like, you know, why should I fight? What, what should I do? Should I fight in the war or not? Mm -hmm. Should I leave my husband? These kind of questions, they kind of go beyond anything that you can observe or you, you can't, you know, <laughs> you can't just sort of look, you know, well, you might want to come in here, right? <laughs> <laughs> and those, there's no easy answer to, the, mm. to these kinds of questions. And, uh, and there's no theoretical answer. Like the answer has to be lived and embodied and seen through in your life in a certain kind absolutely, of Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So there's no theory that you can reach for mm. or a self-help book really that will tell you what you ought to do. Uh, you know, in order to work out what you have to do, mm -hmm. one, one of the difficulties is, is really trying to get a grip on what the situation mm -hmm. is and try and see things clearly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think kind of all that stuff comes together in the way we try to integrate the, the narrative the, of, of the book mm -hmm. with the philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we really wanted for the book was that in a way you could read it in two layers sort of simultaneously. So on the one hand, it's a kind of story grounded in this amazing moment in world history with all these characters sort of teaming around and, you know, they're in Europe, they're in London, they're in Cambridge, they're, um, you know, th this great kind of melting pot of life at this amazing moment in history for women in particular, yeah. for women's education. Um, and, you know, this kind of lovely story of these four women's friendship mm -hmm. um, in despite, you know, all the obstacles that were in the way. <laughs> that you like. So on the one hand, we wanted it to be just this joyful celebration of these four incredible women. And, and we wanted it to be readable as sort of adventure story in a way but at the same time we wanted to lay through that story sort of philosophical questions and problems that were coming up for these women and for the people around them as a result of where they were situated mm -hmm. right historically and, and socially and everything else and then kind of give the philosophy that enables enabled them and would enable you to solve those problems mm -hmm. so in a way there's a sort of philosophical argument through the book mm -hmm. um, that is sort of you know mirroring or, or tied to the other narrative you know the mm -hmm. historical narrative that's what we wanted and maybe we could talk about the framing of the book as one mm -hmm. way of bring that out mm -hmm. you wanna... yeah um, <laughs> so the book opens with a scene uh, whereby Elizabeth Anscombe um she she's object so uh, Oxford University in 1956 wanted to award uh, Harry S Truman an honorary degree and mm -hmm. Elizabeth uh, Anscombe objected to this and she um she went to uh, the what is it called convocation mm -hmm. <laughs> convocation which is um a meeting of the kind of governors, if you like, of, of the university. Um, she went to uh, the meeting of convocation and mm -hmm. she delivered a speech um, giving reasons why she thought that he should not be uh, given the honor, honorary degree. And the basic reason um, was that he uh, committed mass murder in dropping the bombs in, on Hir Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. um, and that she didn't think that uh, Oxford University should, uh, you know, she she said that, you know, to honor a murder is is to, in a way, you can. What is the right? What is the exact mm -hmm. quote that she says? Um, anyway, you can participate kind of in the badness of an action through mm -hmm. kind of flattery or praise, mm -hmm. uh, and um, so she objects to the action of honoring him uh, with um, uh, with with um, an honorary degree. So that so the, the book opens with her, uh, sort of quite dramatic. It's one of the most dramatic bits of the book, I think we try to sort of stage it and um, it's her, her, her delivering her speech. But the way we've set it up is that, you know, the, the Dons there, they don't, they can't follow her line of argument. They don't know what she's saying. Um, 
Yeah, so so that so and what we do then in that scene is that we we try to use the scene to kind of give you a philosophical problem to think about. Um, so you know, a typical defense of Truman would be like, well, um, had he not dropped the bombs, you know, the war would have gone on longer. The, the war would have gone on longer. Um, if there had there been a land invasion, um, you know, millions more would have died. And so by dropping the bombs, you know. Okay, he killed like 200,000 people, maybe a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but had he not dropped them, mm -hmm. let's say 2 million people would have died. Okay, And so the kind of calculation is, well, fewer lives were lost ultimately, and therefore that's that makes the action kind of justifiable. Um, so this is the kind of reasoning that uh, Elizabeth Anscombe objected to. Uh, she called it a kind of co consequentialist reasoning. So on this particular view, um, what you need to look at is just the overall consequences. So, mm. um, you know, overall, it would be better if fewer people were killed. Um, mm -hmm. um, so that would be an argument in favor of kind of mm -hmm. dropping the bombs. Um, so we, we, so we use that scene to set up this particular problem, but the actual argument that she gives and the underlying philosophy that um, that makes it available is is pretty is pretty sophisticated mm. philosophy. And what we do in the course of the book is we give the reader the means to understand um, Elizabeth's argument. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the book, we actually return to Elizabeth's argument and we make it available to the reader. But hopefully the, uh, by that point, the reader will have got all of the conceptual material that they need to 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 get the payoff and then you know you can decide for yourself whether or not you agree uh, with Elizabeth's charge mm -hmm. um so she you know in a nutshell we'll let you read the book because <laughs> you have to do the philosophy kind of yourself to get to it but um she you know she defines murder as uh, killing innocent people as a means to an end um and Truman according to her uh dropped you know he killed innocent people in order to mm -hmm. to um secure the end of the war mm -hmm. as that counts as murder mm -hmm. uh, in her in her book um but and she says you know very striking thing she says is she knew she she wants to turn your attention away from the consequences mm -hmm. to the action itself mm -hmm. so she says you know murder is the very worst kind of human action and here she's asking us not to look at the consequences, but actually to look at the, the action itself mm -hmm. and to see that, that that as something that a human being has done mm -hmm. and to think about what it is for a human to commit murder and how that as a human action somehow goes against our nature and our, our goodness. Mm -hmm. um, and in such a way that, to honour somebody who was famously a murderer mm -hmm. is somehow, uh, you know, to to become to share in the the badness of of that action. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is all making it sound like it's a very <laughs> very serious and depressing book, but actually, um, one of the things that I, I think we both really wanted for the book is that although the scene is so devastating, mm -hmm. because uh, hit heroines I suppose are these lit vibrant young mm -hmm. women kind of mm -hmm. who were so exuberant about the possibilities that this education that they're mm -hmm. having and that philosophy affords them um it, it's also there's a lot of fun I, I think in yeah. the book as well a lot of mm -hmm. you know humor and mm -hmm. absurdity and yeah. confusion yeah <laughs> and uh, yeah adventure. yeah and I mean the you know, it's bookended by this, by the, you know, by the, by this particular case, and but the whole idea of what's inimical to human flourishing and you know what is evil or not good, let's say, in order to kind of bring that into view, you have to have like a picture of of, of what is good about human life and mm. human, you know, uh, what human good amounts to, and like that's what the book is sort mm. of showing, isn't mm. it? Um, so it is, it is full of. Uh, yeah, you know, life and adventure and thinking about, you know, what jokes, jokes yeah. yeah, think, you know, what is meaningful love. in human life, friendship, love, jokes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there are disappointments along the way as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think, so, yeah. yeah, I think just before um, we talk, maybe we could talk a bit about, I mean, I don't know how often you have two authors on together, oh, yeah. but we can maybe, but just, I suppose, one kind of final thing is you might be thinking, okay, well, Elizabeth Anscombe, Mary Midgley, Philippa Foote, and Iris Murdoch, um, you know, what else is in the, what, you know, what else but those, uh, those four women? Well, one of the things that we were really keen to do was to use the story of these women and their lives to kind of elevate or lift up other figures mm -hmm. who we think are really important in their philosophy, but also should be important to us now, who uh, on the kind of standard narrative that, that we learn as students, have been kind of trampled or, or yeah. erased or whatever, however you want to put that. So one really important group for us is, was obviously the women academics. And, and these are the women who kind of were teaching them in the women's colleges. Many of them didn't publish very much, mm -hmm. but what they did was, was really incredible. And they you know, were kind of materially important in, mm -hmm. in helping our, our women along. But the other really important group for us intellectually were the refugee scholars, mm -hmm. um, who, in a way, I think their contribution to the current of Anglo-American philosophy has been really, at, le at least it hasn't been emphasized. People mm -hmm. haven't paid very much attention to that. Yeah, have they? not in the case of Oxford philosophy. Yeah. Yeah, more so, I would say, in, in, the, in, the, in the US. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, but certainly, yeah, in terms of this the standard story that we get mm -hmm. about Oxford philosophy. And yet, you know, in this period, there were so many incredible philosophers and, and thinkers coming from yeah. Europe as refugees, you know, with nothing, who were given or, or offered uh, teaching and, and bits and pieces of work within the university and who were tutoring mm -hmm. our women. Some really incredible scholars from the Warburg School, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Ernst Cassera's son, Heinz Cassera, mm -hmm. uh, Lottie Lebowski, mm -hmm. um, Raymond Klebowski, mm -hmm. all these yeah. incredible figures yeah. that really we didn't know anything about, but all of mm -hmm. a sudden they were you know, part of this story mm -hmm. that is also a story about Wittgenstein and, and Eyre and Austin and, and these more well, well known figures. So we really wanted to use our four women as a kind of uh, a centre of gravity around which these other narratives could emerge. Does that sound? Yeah, absolutely. Sounds, yeah. Yeah. No, it, it is a really kind of a counter narrative, I think, to this to the standard story. Mm -hmm. Of analytic philosophy so yeah I mean it was e even richer than we could have hoped for mm -hmm. actually when we started doing the archival work mm -hmm. um and it really does sort of substantiate substantiate you know Mary's initial claim which is you know it was very significant that the men were away because uh, you know as Mary says their, their voices could be heard or whatever but why it was so significant was because of the kind of education they got, who taught them. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned Donald McKinnon, he's very important. There's a number of women academics, but the but these refugee scholars, I mean, it has been said, and I don't know if it's true or not, but people have said that Oxford was a bit of an, even an academic backwater mm -hmm. relative to kind of major centres, you know, like Prague or Paris or Rome, not, no, not so much Rome, <laughs> um, Berlin, Hamburg, you know, um, relative to these um, large uh, intellectual centres, it was it's a bit of a backwater, but suddenly, um, no, no, actually I should say Milan, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, suddenly these sort of giant scholars mm. you know of, of Europe from all over um mm -hmm. were kind of converging on the pavements of Oxford mm. kind of just from these young women and again it was only the second generation I mean um Mary I think the first time that women could vote the first time they had a meaningful vote in the UK mm. was in 1928 I think it was called the mm. flapper vote so our women were going up shortly after that I mean their mothers were the first generation to vote so it's the most extraordinary time, these young women, very privileged women, obviously, um, arriving at university at the same time as these mm. sort of you know, giant scholars mm. were, were uh, you know, converging in Oxford. And um, 
you know that they were the the people that were that, mm. that were first educated really by them mm. i mean they did start the, the refugees did start coming off scene from 1933 mm. onwards but um yeah by the time elizabeth anscombe came mm -hmm. that and was kind it, of the also i think it. it was only really when the male mm -hmm. academics were called away yeah that suddenly, you know, there was all a the, there was a need for mm -hmm. people to to do mm -hmm. the teaching, if yeah. you like, and that that was yeah. when some of these other mm -hmm. called. Just one other group of people that I, and maybe this will lead us on to talking a little bit about writing the book, um, was the other the other group of people that I just wanted to mention <laughs> is like the mothers. Oh, the mothers. Yeah, yeah. because. Um, one of the things that we realized quite soon when we were writing, and the wives, mm. you know, one of the things we realized quite soon when we were writing um, was that it's so natural when you're writing, even when you're writing about women, yes. to, you know, write about, well, her father was a such and such, or, you know, to write about a woman and mention the husband, but when you're writing about a man, not to mention the wife. And it really, it kind mm. of took took us a little while to notice took that this to notice. kept mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, to correct it. And once we started correcting it and realizing that every time we had a, you know, a male scholar, we would like find out who their wife, who his wife was. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, where every time we introduce a male scholar, we'll find out who his mother was suddenly all these women who you know they weren't kind of household name women they were sort of ordinary women mm -hmm. but you know they were doing extraordinary things they were editing poetry magazines they were starting up workers education societies mm -hmm. in Glasgow they were you know they were setting up new colleges mm -hmm. they were you know suddenly you realize that there were this doesn't you know there's hundreds of these stories of these you know women that you never even noticed and they haven't le left a trace mm -hmm. but there's material you can find out about mm -hmm. them and so we made a really conscious effort throughout the book to you know instead of saying her father did this to say mm -hmm. oh her mother did mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. and often what the mother did was you know completely astonishing yeah, that's given true when they were living and, and mm -hmm. the kind of constraints that would have been on their, mm -hmm. on their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that was mm -hmm. a really nice thing to be able yeah. to do. Yeah. And I think, I think, yeah, that connects, as you said, Rachel, to, um, yeah, the, the difficulty of kind of not occupying the kind of standard, I suppose, mm. male perspective mm. in general and uh, thinking about perspective a lot. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we really, we don't really intrude as authors very much in the narrative and I think that was very much conscious because we we felt that if we kept bringing ourselves into the narrative as authors it would somehow place the women much more in the past and kind of trap them there as it were whereas we wanted them to be really sort of free mm -hmm. to kind of move around space and time and we tried to kind of create places so that you could kind of imagine them almost moving around in the space mm -hmm. beyond what you actually get in the narrative so we did try and create a world so you'll yeah. have to judge and see <laughs> yourself did have we created a world but we did try and do that um and we were just talking about this earlier because I do think that maybe that's a kind of advantage of the co-authorship mm. um do you understand? yeah well I don't know if you agree with that but yeah I, do. I mean the co-authorship is so internal to the whole project yeah. and our friendship is mm -hmm. so internal to the whole project and of course the other thing is that we were writing the book entirely during the pandemic mm -hmm. so it was a sort of incredibly intimate in a way because mm -hmm. it was just us two mm -hmm. and the four women yeah. <laughs> and we had all their letters and all mm. their journals and we had all these videos of Mary um and so and photographs and stuff so we had our own little friendship bubble of mm -hmm. us and them mm -hmm. and so that made it really kind of close in mm -hmm. that sort of way but I thought it was really interesting what you were saying earlier about the ways in which our co-authoring helped us to sort of think through them as characters yeah I think that's right because when you you know we used a lot of diary entries and things like that and you know obviously they're dated and so on they 
and they're recording different events. But often, sometimes it happened that Rachel and I would have sort of different interpretations of those events. Mm. Um, M- M- Rachel's are more sympathetic, usually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah so uh, we'd have different impressions perhaps of of of, of the way a, a particular relationship was developing or how mm. to interpret um a particular gesture or thing that you know so talking through the different kind of interpretations i definitely think it gives more kind of psychological reality or kind of mm. depth or something i mean i don't know um or there was would be times where maybe I remember one occasion where Mm. I think maybe it was Rachel had written something about Mary um, and what she was wearing or where how she was seated or something and I said oh I don't I don't think she would sit like that (laughs) surely she'd sit this way or you know Um, and loads of that happened quite often Mm. didn't it you know so we would you're like oh I don't think that's quite and then we talk it through and then Mm. you have to justify or give reasons why you think that and then you, you kind of are able to bring yeah, you kind of get a deeper, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, I think, I definitely think it adds some sort of dimensionality. So I think having those sort of different perspectives on on the same sort of event can can give a kind of depth. Um, but yeah, but then there's just the writing style as well. Mm-hmm. Like, like loads of the jokes are Rachel's. Yeah. She's a much drier sense of humor than me. So if you're laughing, that's probably Rachel. Yeah, that is, um, I do. I do funnier. like. Yeah, She's I think funnier. it's because my background is in Wittgenstein. Oh yeah. So Wittgenstein really? said you could write an entire book of philosophy just in jokes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which definitely... I'm not sure if that's quite true. Yeah. But I mean, in a way, philosophy, and this is something that Wittgenstein was really had an eye to. Like, in a way, philosophy does bring you to the edges mm. of absurdity I think mm. Mary was very Definitely. much of that that mm. view as well you know there's um there's a line in Wittgenstein's uncertainty I think it's where there's two philo- there's two people sitting in deck chairs mm-hmm. by a tree and one of them saying but how do I know it's a tree yeah and the other ones that they, they keep repeating this over and over again and somebody's walking past and he says oh don't worry they're only two yeah that's in our book <laughs> But it's like, it's that, you yeah. know, there is a certain kind absurdity. of absurdity yeah. that you have to sit with when you're doing philosophy and you're yeah. thinking, you know, oh, well, you know, is, is this book real? <laughs> like, do I have a, do you have a mind? You know, it's, there's a kind of strangeness mm-hmm. that you have to occupy, mm-hmm. isn't there? Mm-hmm. And I think... Um, one of the things that's lovely about all of the women is that they, mm-hmm. you know, they have a really clear sense of the absurd mm-hmm. and a really clear sense of the real, like yes. of what's serious, what's real, what matters, like when to have a straight face mm-hmm. and when to, mm-hmm. you know, realise that things have kind of tipped over mm-hmm. into something that, mm-hmm. that the, the right response to. I mean, mm-hmm. Mary... Um, Midgley has that lovely thing where she's talking about um, philosophers who are kind of obsessively worrying about whether anything exists other than mm. themselves. And her response is something like, oh, come on, grow up. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. get, and, you know, and on, of course you can take that question really seriously, but sometimes the right response is to say, mm-hmm. oh, come on, grow up. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah, that's really nice. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're right. So I have the jokes, but you have, I think I said this earlier, this incredible eye for sort of detail and texture and pattern and and nature and, and objects. And, yeah, we know, made you, it quite material as yeah, well. Yeah, but yeah. I think that was you. I think I yeah. always go to the kind of thoughty stuff when mm. you go to the sort of materiality. Mm. Um, so yeah. but then so in the end the th- we had to do it together yeah. yeah 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 obviously we edit each other a lot yeah <laughs> Rachel <laughs> takes my stuff out and then I put it well. back in <laughs> yeah. yeah so anyway so that gives you a flavor of it but, I mean it is I do think it is um it does have an unusual feel to it the book mm-hmm. I think I mean it has a sl- it is it's got it's, pictures it's got well. pictures it's got pictures and it's got pubs and actually so poems, the book, yes, yeah, the the book came out in the UK in February. And one of the things that has surprised us is that none of the reviewers, even those who've been very, very 
praiseful of it mm-hmm. have mentioned the pictures the or the poems, poems yeah. which for us I think were really part of the material mm-hmm. of the They're part of the argument, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's got loads of lovely pictures and some mm-hmm. really nice poems, and including one by Mary and mm-hmm. one by Iris Murdoch as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So, yeah. so, so you can maybe thing. that's another reason to <laughs> <laughs> pick up the book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I mean, we can obviously, you can as take you can some see, we can maybe, keep yeah. talking forever, yeah. but um, it would be lovely if there was any questions or mm-hmm. any input um, mm-hmm. from the floor, so to speak. Yeah, um, I would say if anyone who's here has any questions, now is the time to ask, speak now, or forever hold your peace. I don't have any questions at the moment. Oh. No. Mm-hmm. no. So if I don't get any, then you all can keep talking for a little bit longer and then we'll wrap it up for the evening. So I'll let you know if there are any more questions. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, um, maybe then, because one thing we haven't done is we haven't sort of introduced the four women, mm-hmm. particularly. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we've talked, we've said mentioned their names, but I suppose... Um, as a kind in the last sort of few minutes um we could just say a little bit about each Mm -hmm. of the Mm -hmm. each of the women and Mm -hmm. what's interesting about them Mm -hmm. I suppose Mm -hmm. um so shall I shall I start (laughs) Rachel is a resident Anscombe yeah well yeah I mean I do love Elizabeth Anscombe I have to say so Elizabeth Anscombe um was the is the oldest of our our four heroines so she was the first oh yeah this is this is her here she was the first of them to to go up to oxford a year oh rachel i have a question that ties into actually what you're talking Ooh. about so it'll be a great talking point to add in mm-hmm. um were a viewer asked were the sources for each of the women different in a way that shaped your ability to draw their characters Ooh, on the page that's a really good question with the sources sources yeah the archival sources yeah yeah they really were um in really interesting ways, actually, that sort of speaks to the women's characters. characters. Themselves, yeah, yeah. So obviously Mary, she was her own source. Like we actually knew her for quite a while and we had loads of conversations with her. And then when just before she died, she gifted us her entire archive, which is now at Durham, mm-hmm. which is full of loads of personal correspondence and letters and mm-hmm. papers and all sorts of stuff. But mm-hmm. really... Her, the main source we had for Mary was Mary herself mm-hmm. <laughs> and a really gorgeous memoir that she wrote in the 90s called The Owl of Minerva. Yeah, it's worth reading. So, yeah. yeah, she was the, the closest one mm-hmm. in that in that respect. Um, Iris Murdoch, I mean, you can say about her source base. Iris Murdoch's archive in Kingston University um, is just Overwhelming. astonishing. <laughs> yeah. There's maybe 5,000 letters, I think. Yeah. Um, there's a large number of her, well, there's about 10, 12 journals, mm-hmm. I think, um, a number of which have been just, uh, transcribed, actually. Um, oh, there's huge numbers of postcards. I mean, she was a prolific uh, correspondent. Mm-hmm. So she used to kind of write in the morning and then in the afternoon, she would spend four hours uh, writing postcards, letters to her various friends. Mm-hmm. And I mean... But the yeah, journals... The are... journals are... Yeah, I, they're just brilliant. I mean, they've hardly been looked at in terms of the philosophical content. Mm-hmm. I think, I mean, I think it's fair to say that we've probably used them yeah, philosoph- philosophically yeah. more than, you know, they, they're just a treasure trove. Um, and we should say that the reason, or amongst the reasons that the uh, the Iris Murdoch archive is so incredible is Peter Conradi, Peter Conradi yeah. who wrote the Iris Murdoch uh, biography which is fantastic yeah. um, which more treats of her as a literary as an author than a, than a philosopher mm-hmm. but he all the material that he mm-hmm. collected from that book which is includes sort of dozens and dozens mm-hmm. of letters and interviews that he did with people that he knew yeah. that knew her including school friends yeah. and old teachers mm-hmm. and also all, the, all of that lot. he gifted to Kingston yes yeah, so that's the Peter Conradi archive yeah. at the Iris Murdoch so in a way yeah. with Iris Murdoch she was sort of 
I mean, we were overwhelmed. Yeah, was, yeah we had to we had to kind of keep it under wraps, <laughs> yeah. really, didn't we? Because yeah. you could just there's, yeah. there's so much material. There's um all of her library as well. So yeah. um and she annotated books. Mm. I mean, some books are just black with notes. So yeah. for, you know, from a scholarly perspective I mean there's just so much but in a way it kind of reflects her personality Absolutely. doesn't it because yeah. she's so, so exuberant yeah and she's such a kind of life force isn't she Absolutely. you know she of all the characters in her book in a way she gets some really serious blows doesn't she mm. but every time you know the next day she's up on her feet yeah. and she's yeah. got all these new plans mm. and she's off again so yeah, and her letters are just like constant outpourings of love and uh, yeah, energy, you and feel you like, see it in the like the you know, just the type. Of, what is it? The like just typography. Now, yeah. what's the equivalent? The graph, graphology, the graph, you know, yeah. like just all the underlinings, exclamation mark, the, the drawings. Just yeah, you feel like if you ever received one letter, like her letters you'd feel like it was from the love of your life. Yeah. But she was writing letters like that to dozens and yeah. dozens of people. Yeah, people have said that. Yeah, I mean... So that was her. And then the Anscombe archive is very different. Yeah, so Elizabeth Anscombe um, is an amazing woman. So she, in a way... Um, so she was a Wittgenstein student and translated the philosophical investigations and was then his literary executor. So has a lot, had a lot of dealings with the Wittgenstein Nachlass. And she became uh, sort of, you know, a very famous philosopher and very famously, um, oh, how do I put this? Um, short, short with people who she didn't think were intellectually serious or um who she thought were hypocritical or lacking in integrity and she was catholic as well she was a catholic convert so she had very strong views um on particular uh, moral topics that were very much against the spirit of the age mm -hmm. and so she got in lots of arguments and in a way um her, uh, her ac our, our access to her through the sources was from two heavily kind of curated respects, really. On the one hand, there's there's dozens and dozens of anecdotes about Anscombe that mm. are repeated, mostly anecdotes told by men who she didn't like and who didn't like her, and usually ones that are unpleasant and are about her body or her clothes or the state of her house. and you know, you can see with a lot of those that they're coming from a place of misogyny, mm. sexism, at least. So we had a kind of a, a, a set of anecdotes about her that gave us a kind of caricature of, of this person, Elizabeth Anscombe. And then the other thing we had is there's an incredible archive now at uh, UPenn, which is contains lots of her unpublished and published philosophical work. But that archive um, w was is very much cur curated by her children. Yes. In the sense that they, sh it, there's not very much personal stuff in there. There's bits and pieces, mm -hmm. but they've largely stripped out, you know, all the personal stuff mm -hmm. that would give you too much insight into her, her kind of psychology. So we had some really important sources for her. So for one thing, we had was the. Um, the Mary Somerville Research Fellowship yes. report. So these were the reports that she filed to the college um, just after she graduated when she had a research fellowship. And they give you a really lovely sense mm -hmm. of where her philosophy is, but also of her personality, mm -hmm. don't they? Yeah, they're there's, really important there's documents, a few, actually. There's a few yeah. really nice letters. Um, obviously, Mary knew her. So we did, we pieced her together in a more, it was it was more of a challenge because we had this kind mm -hmm. of detritus in a way that we had to kind of get mm -hmm. through to get to her. I mean, she appears quite a lot in Iris Murdoch's journals. She and does, she's very yes. different, you know, that Elizabeth that appears in those journals is really different oh to the Elizabeth goodness, of the anecdotes, yeah. you know, so that was really good. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, Rachel is an Anscombe scholar, whereas I'm not. So I, I, I knew the anecdotes, but I didn't, there wasn't like a, a weight of tradition mm. sort of behind me in a way, which I'm mm. really, you know, from my perspective, the anecdotes and 
the Elizabeth on the page mm. that you read about um, through well through Mary, but also in in the uh, Iris Murray. They don't doesn't no. really add up. No. So um, Philip of Foot, yeah, the Philip of Foot. There's there's a lot less. Mm. Um, so she, yeah, Philip of Foot. So the, in in Somerville. Um, there's a few boxes, mm-hmm. maybe eight or nine mm. boxes. Uh, there's some journals from later in her life. There's uh, a few letters. There's nice really reference, lovely, lovely reference. reference letters, and some notebooks that she that she had. Um, that just notebooks that she had uh, when she lived with Iris Murdoch in London in uh, 1942. And some amazing letters to her mother. From Beautiful letters time, to her yeah. mum. Yeah. So there is some material there, but she um, disposed of a lot of her letters. I think mm-hmm. she burned a whole suitcase of letters from uh, Donald, Donald McKinnon. McKinnon. Yeah. Um, and I think at the beginning, I definitely felt like her, I mean, an amazing thing about writing a book is, is it's sort of getting to know the women through this kind of ma- the materiality mm-hmm. of these letters and things. And I felt like with Philippa, first, if I don't mind calling her Philip, but I really felt she was somehow getting in her way sort of physically mm. because she burnt these letters, you know, mm-hmm. that she, you know, it's like she knew not that we were coming, but like, <laughs> you know, in the future, some, mm. some people like us might be sort of sniffing around. Yeah. And so she sort of, you know, so her, her, her physical presence was somehow salient or manifest to us mm-hmm. through those actions. Um, and, and uh, it is true that Iris Murdoch said of her that she was pathologically discreet. Pathologically discreet. And so that, and that also comes through. Yeah, there. and she sort of left that behind, didn't she? She left that behind. Yeah. And I think we were both really aware that um I feel I feel quite happy with the way that we brought Philippa to light, but there was not loads to go on. Um and so yeah, we had to be quite careful and mm-hmm. kind of I think. It, it it fitted with what we found in the archives, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, and again we had Iris Murdoch, yeah. sort of love for her, and some yeah. incredible letters between Iris yeah. Murdoch and Philip of Foot yeah. as well. So we have Iris's side of the correspondence. Yeah. Um, what there's about eighty letters, I think. Yeah. yeah. So we got a lot there, and of course Mary was able to tell us about Philippa yeah. as well, as she knew her. Yeah. Um, yeah. They went on a few holidays to Greece together and got yeah. a few stories there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's a really, that is a really good question. It yeah. was, yeah, it was, yeah, a fascinating experience for us because we're, because as philosophers, we're used to dealing with published work, um, which has the form of kind of tightly curated, polished argument. Mm-hmm. And to find ourselves kind of with all this material mm-hmm. all this materiality and all these letters and mm-hmm. journals it was one of the most joyful things yeah it was amazing and I think as well too with the Murdoch journals in particular like trying to kind of reconstruct her mm. thought processes as she was trying to come to terms mm. with stuff that she was reading so reading what she was reading and then reading mm. what she was writing in her journal about what she was reading and yeah I mean we love that kind of thing so yeah. but there are bits of that in the book as well mm-hmm. so you do get a sense of that kind of there's a lot of sort of jottings if you like um that we've mm-hmm. taken from the journals and we've we've been able to place them within their philosophical context mm-hmm. a little bit as well so mm-hmm. yeah is that <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we are nearing the end of the hour. So this is a great, I think, stopping point. You all have been great. Um, Thank you for joining us on At Home with Literati tonight, especially so late in the night for you. And thanks to our viewers. Make sure you buy Metaphysical Animals. The link is in the chat, as well as the event listing that brought you here. And of course, you can buy it in our store. Contact us by phone or email. And um, thanks for your support. We will see you at the next event. Thanks. And thank you all for being here.